Hello, I'm David McGowan, and welcome to Untold Stories. This episode was recorded live on stage at the Florida Theater in downtown Jacksonville on November 27th, 2021. And this audio series is a production of WJCT Public Media and the Florida Theater. Later in this episode, I'll be joined by Numa Saislin, president of the Florida Theater, and Barbara Colicello, the artistic director of Untold Stories, to talk about how this local storytelling series came to life. Untold Stories at the Florida Theater is made possible in part by generous support from the Wolfbrook family. So, I want to take a deep breath because we are here. And we are here just to listen to stories. There's no big fanfare. There's no special effects. It's simply to listen to story. The way people have for so many years gather around the fire pit, the fire, the bonfire, and share a story. And, well, we don't have a fire pit, which is probably a good thing, but our storytellers have a fire in their bellies. A fire that they have that will spark out up from them and their words and their imagery and those moments that they hold so deeply from the past will be given to you. And you will receive it. And I call that witnessing. So for me, this is sort of a very sacred ritual. The art of telling and shaping story and having people listen and that's what we're doing tonight we're going to kick off the evening with the beautiful voice of Meredith Mason and she's a songwriter and a singer in Jacksonville she originally is from Pittsburgh and she really was seeking the Sun And so she's here. I mean, I I think we can all relate to that. So um, she's going to be doing a song from one of her albums. Give her a big hand. It wasn't my choice, and it's nobody's fault. But the tide slips through my fingers so fast now. I'm all out of love. When I can't find my voice Will you look at me and smile If you untangle my bones I will love you when you're wrong I will love you when you're wrong I will love you like the moon I'm like the sea the ebb and flow of you and me it's alright now when I want to get lost you light the way sink into the depths of me stay if you want tango my bones I will love you when you're wrong I will love you when you're wrong Ooh. I will love you when you're wrong Come into the water Swim a little deeper Wish it was clearer You'll get the best of me Every little heartbreak Every little mistake Has brought you to me we were meant to be If you untangle my bones I will love you when you're wrong 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 I will love you Meredith Mason. So I am excited 
to introduce our first storyteller. She wrote in her bio that she adores center stage. So I said, aha, I know who I'm starting the evening off with, Zanetta Marie. She feels blessed to be part of the Jacksonville theater community, and I think we're blessed. Uh, Zanetta's been in stage readings and plays and spoken word, and she sings whenever she can. A love to words of inspiration from Dr. Maya Angelou. And she says, there is no greater agony than an untold story inside of you. And tonight, we're going to hear Zanetta Marie's story. Welcome her. <laughs> Woo! Good evening. 214 North Hogan Street. 214 North Hogan Street between Adams and Monroe, right over there, less than a half mile from where I'm standing. I received a phone call while at work, while I was on the fifth floor. It was a phone call that would change the way I viewed my childhood. I wasn't born here in Jacksonville. I was born in Boston, Massachusetts. My family moved around quite a bit when I was growing up, really only because my mother liked change. I came to make my home in Jacksonville very many years later. Well, I must have been around eight years old, living in Boston at home, that I shared a bedroom with my big sister. Now, my side of the room was always so clean. My bed was always made, everything in its place. But my sister's side of the room was always such a mess. I mean, my sister never made her bed. She had clothes strewn everywhere. I mean, she had plates of food so old, it looked like a science experiment. I would think to myself, how in the world could we be sisters and you be such a slob? Well, she overheard me one morning, a Saturday morning, which was typically clean up at our house. She heard me call her a slob, and she was hot with me. My sister's brown eyes looked black as she peered down at me and she said, that's why nobody ever wanted you. That's why Ma and Daddy found you in a trash bag at the side of the road. <gasps> I looked up at my sister, and I started to laugh. <laughs> I said, you're just mad because I'm so special. Mm. And I was. When I was a kid growing up in my house, I was the queen. I had everything I ever wanted. Everything flowed to me. I'll tell you, when I was a kid, I had the nickname of Miss G. I'll explain. I had the nickname of Gigi. Some called me G. Don't even ask me how I got that nickname. But my mother put respect on my nickname and started calling me Miss G. I had adults everywhere calling me Miss G. And I lived up to it. Grape soda. When I was a kid, I loved grape soda. There was always grape soda in the refrigerator with my name on it, and nobody better touch it because it belonged to Miss G. Sears used to send out their Christmas catalog every single year. I would run to the mailbox like it was addressed to me, get that catalog, come into the kitchen, open up the junk drawer, get a pen out, plop down at the table and mark everything I wanted for Christmas. Now, I would be lying to you if I told you I didn't get almost everything I wanted every year for Christmas. I tell you, I was spoiled rotten. Even my sister put me on a pedestal whether she wanted to admit it or not. Now, I must have been around, around 22 or so. We were living in Los Angeles by then. I told you my mother liked change. And I was at work when I received a phone call from my mother. And for the first time in my life, I heard something in my mother's voice I'd never heard before. It was fear. You see, my mother was extremely feisty. She was a small woman, beautiful mahogany skin, small features, but she was feisty. I mean, my mother could curse you out so quickly, you didn't even have time to form a word in your thoughts. 
Now, she was heavily educated, don't get it wrong, but she was feisty. But she wasn't feisty that evening. My mother was afraid. And she didn't call me Miss G this evening. Zonetta Marie, yes. This is your mother, yes. Well, I got into a heated argument with your sister this evening, yes. Well, I told her that she needed to tell the boys something about their mother. And she told me that if you mess with mine, I'll mess with yours. Yes? Well, she threatened to come to your job and tell you, and I vowed I wouldn't have that. So I'm calling to tell you. Tell me what, Ma? Well, you're adopted. What? Well, we'll talk about it some other time. Don't work too hard and, and make sure you eat. Adopted? How the hell could I be adopted? See, because as far back as I can remember, my mother used to always say to me, Miss G, you have beautiful brown eyes just like your father. So when my father would get home from work after cutting hair at the barbershop all day, I would run to him. Well, especially because, you know, he had something special for Miss G. But I would look into his eyes and I think, surely we do, right? Or my dad would always say to me, Miss G, you got a singing voice just like your Aunt Mary in New York. Yes, you do. Now, how the heck could I have brown eyes like my father and have a singing voice like my Aunt Mary in New York if I'm adopted? That's why nobody ever wanted you. That's why Ma and Daddy found you in a trash bag at the side of the road. My sister finally had her say, and maybe even the last laugh, I was angry. I was at a low ebb. I felt like I didn't know where I belonged, no identity, unwanted. And I wasn't angry with my sister. See, she was 14 years old when I came home from the hospital, and she probably did resent me. And I was not angry at my father either, because my dad was like a silent type of dad that just worked hard and took good care of his family. I was angry with my mother, because how could she not tell me? How did she let me go all these years not knowing? Well, I decided I was going to find my birth mother. I reached out to the Department of Children and Family Services in Boston. 214 North Hogan Street, between Adams and Monroe, right over there on the fifth floor, I received the call. Miss Thomas, yes. This is Miss Scarborough, your caseworker. Yes. Well, I found your birth mother. Okay. Well, she said she doesn't want to go another day without speaking with you. And as I pelted my birth mother, a stranger, with all the questions I had pent up inside of me for almost a decade since my mother told me I was adopted, I realized every single one of her answers didn't even matter. Because most of her answers were, how could you ask me something like that? I, I really don't remember. Don't be mad. All I could think was, my mother, the one who raised me, she always talked to me. She always listened. She was always there to protect me. And even though my mother never talked to me about my adoption, my life was a testament to her love for me. So I resolved my anger that day for my mother, and I replaced it with gratitude. I was grateful that my mother and my father adopted a black baby in a hospital in Boston, Massachusetts in 1968. And I realized, because I was a parent by then, that we make decisions for our children based on what we think is best for them at the time, and we love them and we take care of them the best way we know how. And not only did my mother love me and my father, they wanted me, and I was chosen. Thank you.
So next up, I'll be near the mic, um, is Kedgar Volta. Now, I think of Kedgar, you know, in talking and hearing about his, his stories and the way his mind works. He's a, he's a maker. He's a tinkerer. But when I talk about tinkering, he takes, he tinkers big, really big. He is adept at creative disciplines spanning the gamut from immersive art to broadcast production and editing, animation and projection, mapping. His media art projects have garnered national and international acclaim. And tonight, Kedgar takes us behind the scenes and shares the logistical challenges of making a humongous light installation. He'll tell you the details. So please welcome Kedgar. It is May of 2019, and I'm standing on the sidewalk on Laura Street in downtown Jacksonville when the director of the Museum of Contemporary Art approaches me and very casually says, would you like to create a site-specific installation for the atrium space at MoCA? Uh, wait, wait, what? Of course I want to. You see, I have dreamed of showing my work at MoCA for a long, long time, and dreams are not to take lightly. Dreams are the reason that I'm here. You see, by now you can probably tell by my accent that I am not from the States. I, I was born in Cuba. And there I, I saw my mother's dreams, my father's dreams, and the dreams of generations just being crushed by reality. So about 10 years ago, I moved to the States. And this opportunity was a validation that I made the right choice. The next day, I visited the atrium space. And if you haven't been there, just picture a large room with three walls that go all the way up three stories tall. And standing there, I felt overwhelmed with emotions. And I wasn't afraid of the size of the space. I didn't really feel what painters may feel when they are confronting an empty canvas or what a writer may feel when they, when they are confronting an empty page, I felt overwhelmed with emotions because so many people have helped me get to that point. I was so grateful. And just to give you an example, I remember one time when I was in Cuba, and just, you know, we didn't have a lot of resources, but still I was allowed to dream. And I had this school project at the design school, and my idea required a piece of foam. And I tried, I looked for it everywhere, I went to the stores, but, but you can really find that there. But I looked at my mattress, and it was made out of foam. So I looked at my mom, and you can imagine her face when I asked her to let me cut the corner of my mattress. Well, she said yes, and I turned in the school project, and for that day forward, I slept with my feet dangling off the bed. <laughs> so. I begin to work, and, I, and I, what I take with me is this feeling that I had in the space, this gratitude. And when you've been given a month to come up with a proposal, it goes fast like that. And I was ready to present my idea. So I met with Kathleen Doherty, the director of the museum, and Ilva Roos, the senior curator, and we met for lunch, and I opened my laptop, and I showed them my idea. I had envisioned a light sculptor that will be hanging from the atrium, and it will be built out of over a thousand LED lights. The lights were going to be arranged in a circular pattern, and they will be distributed over seven levels, each level increasing in size as it goes up. The piece will direct the viewer to stand right in the middle of the room, right in the middle of the piece, and each one of the 1,008 lights will be pointing at you. And the lights will blink on and off on different times in the same way people help you in different times in your life. And those lights represent the people. 
Within five minutes, they approved the idea. And for the rest of the hour, all I could think of was, crap, this is real now. <laughs> I'm, I could have thought of something significantly simpler to build. Well, it took me two months to figure it out. And during that time, I was, just, I was building prototypes and doing 3D printing and paying attention to the really small details and rebuilding the whole sculpture in a, in a VR headset so I could walk around the virtual atrium space so I could make proper design decisions. Meanwhile, Mocha is calling me because they need the title. And I explained that as part of my creative process, the title is not something that comes up first. I have to spend time with the work. And eventually, the title will reveal. I hoped. After that creation process, or, or, or that discovery process, I had a long list of things that I needed to do, and I placed an order for the materials. The first item in the list was to cut square aluminum tubes into slices. I put the tube on the semi-automatic semi -automatic bend saw, and I press the button, and it begins to go down. And I'm excited. This is this process, right? This is working now. But it's going down very, very slow. It took me over 13 hours of continuous work to finish cutting 1,100 pieces. You see, I'm always busy. I run a business, and I'm mostly working in the evenings and on the weekends. At this rate, it will take me a year to finish the project. So I did the only thing that I thought it was possible, the only logical things. I assembled a team of professionals, or my friends. <laughs> so there's my wife, Adiana. She has worked with me on every project I've ever done. There's um, Mark. You know, He owns the shop that I'm working on, and he's an engineer, so he definitely checks the bill. You know, my friend Keith, or Joe, or Emilio, or Myra, they all signed up to help, and we began working again, this time a little bit faster. So we move on to the second item in the list, and I assign it to Emilio. Emilio is a chef, so he pays attention to details. So I hand him off one of the slices of aluminum tube that I had just finished, and I ask him to sand it down, remove the rough edges, and prep it for painting. He goes away. In a few minutes, he comes back, and you could tell that he did a good job because his face was reflecting. He was, he was happy, right? Everything changed when I pointed to the side and said, you see those boxes right there? There's 1,100 more that I need you to finish. <laughs> At this point, the only thing that is driving me forward is just pure fear. The museum has entrusted me resources to finish the work. There's, there are works on, in the line. What happens if I can finish on time? I can't let down my wife, my friends, my family. And we were simply yet not working fast enough. So I put a, a, a call up on social media, and I explained what the project was and where I needed help. To my surprise, that weekend, a few dozen people showed up. And we began making real, real progress. And the museum keeps calling me about the title, and I just don't have it yet. But now we're making progress. The most beautiful thing is that every weekend after that, people kept showing up until every item in the list was crossed off, just in time for installation. We have allowed ourselves five days to assemble this puzzle into the atrium space. And the first day was beautiful. We were moving like a well-rehearsed orchestra. Cables were going in and out from the computer room up into the ceiling. The speakers were being hung on the wall. We have a winch attached to the center beam of the space with a wire going all the way down and a massive plate with all the electronics in there. And everything is beautiful and ready and we're moving forward. And then the next day comes in and now we're installing the heart of the piece, the lights. You know, First is level number seven, and once it's, it's risen up, that's the one that, that is closer to the ceiling. It is the most difficult one because it's the largest, but also it's the most important one because it supports the way of every level underneath. We begin with a center ring, install the arms that extend out, 
connect the wires, test every single light, light, and it works perfect. Joe climbs on the scissors lift, on the scissor lift all the way up to press the button on the winch to lift it up. And as soon as he does, I say, stop! Things were not working the right way. It was just folding down like an umbrella. And none of the other levels were there yet. So obviously, there was a flaw in the design. And those that knew what was really going on began to worry. And what I did is I just stepped out. And I sat on the corner of the atrium space, contemplating my failure that I had months to think about. And I stood there until I first saw the problem and then eventually saw the solution. So that night, Mark and I went to the shop and worked all night. But the next morning, we walked into the, we walked into the museum with the sunlight behind us in slow motion, like in the movies, carrying the solution. We continued working for the next three days. And on November 14th, after six months of work, the show opened. One more time, I stood in the atrium space right underneath the work, and I could see each one of the 1,008 lights pointing at me. They were coming on and off, dancing at different times, just in the same way people come and help you. You see, Dreams are fragile. There's many external forces that push us away from them. And the promises we make to ourselves and others often require help to be fulfilled. As I walked out of the atrium space, I saw on the wall, printed on big letters, the title of the piece. And it read, The Fragility of the Promise. Thank you. You know, you can see uh, pictures of this installation at MOCA if you go to their website, and that's the Museum of Contemporary Art that's downtown, just in case you haven't been there. And actually, there's a video of Kedgar talking about the piece, so I highly suggest you go look at it now that you know what it took to make. Thank you, Kedgar. Okay, I am curious. How many people grew up with a mother that if you asked her to lop off the corner of your bed would say yes? Anybody? <laughs> I think that's kind of cool <laughs> that she said yes. Um, next up is Jonathan Ross. Jonathan, I met him a while ago. I met him when he was still in college. And he's a writer and a wonderful actor. And he is the son of a sailor. And tonight, Jonathan spins a story about the intangible treasures he finds in an old seaside theater. Please welcome my friend, Jonathan Ross. Thank you, thank you. Um, I didn't know when I got here I was going to be wearing this in sync costume, so I'm really excited about that. Um, as Barb said, my name is Jonathan. I was born in Honolulu, Hawaii. My dad, he was in the Navy, and a couple years later we would move away from Hawaii and we'd move back to the mainland. And on our way to Maine, I'm using the word Maine a lot, uh, we stopped in Ohio, where my family is from. And there my sister was born and thus began an illustrious career for the two of us as Navy brats. And what that looks like for a lot of us is that every three to four years, give or take on either side of that, you're putting all of your shit in the boxes, putting all the boxes onto a truck, and then the truck is going someplace far from home. Now, best case scenario for us was we'd move across the state. Worst case scenario, we would move across the country. Now, to be more specific about what that looked like for Jonathan's life, 
I went to two different kindergartens in the course of one year. Once in uh, southern Florida, and then we hauled butt up to Jacksonville, and I went to kindergarten at Finnegan Elementary over in Mayport. Did a couple more years there, and then we packed all the boxes, and we moved across the state to the Panhandle to a little town called Milton. Uh, Milton doesn't have a lot. There's a high school and a Kmart, and I think that's about all that Milton had. I did a couple more years of elementary school there with kids that had largely known each other since they were in kindergarten, so I was a, kind of the new kid on the block the whole time I was there. Then we would pack our stuff up again when the uh, Y2K hit, and we would move across the country to San Diego, California. Now, San Diego was great. I was able to start and finish middle school all at the same place with the same class. The only downside to that was that it was also an elementary school attached to the middle school. So all of the kids that I met in middle school had been friends since they were in elementary school. Again, I was the fish out of water. I would start high school when I was there, just one year, and the high school was zoned differently than all of my friends from middle school. So here I was in a familiar place surrounded by largely unfamiliar faces. I'd do that year of high school, and we would, once again, pack all of our stuff into boxes and go across country. Now, this time we landed back in Jacksonville, Florida. This is where I would finish up high school. I would make good friends. My dad would go on to retire. I would graduate, kind of look at college, ended up going to FCCJ. And about that time, when my dad retired, it was about time for us, had he not retired, to move again. Now, we weren't beholden to the man anymore, so that wasn't anything that we were particularly in a hurry to do. I, however, had a biological clock that only knew moving every three to four years. So inside, I start developing this kind of social anxiety, this sort of angst, and I exercised it in some ways that weren't so flattering, nothing so detrimental to anybody else around me, but I, to this day, carry a little bit of that social anxiety with me. And around the time that I'm finishing those first two years of college, I'm introduced by a mutual friend to Barb, who you all have heard from this evening. And we did our first play together and then some workshops I would do with her over the next year, year and a half. We did another play. And then that kind of set the stage for this relationship where Barb says jump, then I say how high. Well, I get a call from her one Saturday morning. It's the end of the summer, and at the time, she was working at Players by the Sea, which is a community theater down at Jack's Beach, for those unfamiliar. And she says, hey, Jonathan, in her New York accent that I don't dare try and replicate up here. And uh, she said, Shirley Sachs, who was directing the show, she's looking for somebody f to fill a particular part. I think you'd be great. Would you mind taking a call? I said, how high? So Shirley gives me a call. And I speak with Shirley, and she somehow manages to talk me into doing this end-of-summer musical. Now, let me point out first and foremost that if appearances don't tell you that I'm not much of a musical guy, I'm not much of a musical guy. In high school, I did two musicals. One of those musicals, I was a mute. And it wasn't because I can't sing, because also in high school, I did the garage band thing, much to the neighbor's chagrin. And uh, I was used to kind of being the front man and the guy with a microphone in my face. But I was a good physical actor. I did all this stuff, and so I got cast in that part. But the apprehension I had about doing this end-of-summer musical at Players by the Sea wasn't that it was just any musical. This musical was The Full Monty. Now, for those of you that don't know what The Full Monty is, I'll, I'll let you know real quick the synopsis. It's about a group of blue-collar guys that work in a factory, the factory gets shut down, and they're put out of work, and now they come up with an airbrained scheme to kind of make some money to get by to the next thing, in which they're all going to put on their own version of a Chippendales performance for the ladies in town. Now, that meant that when we got up on that stage, at some point, we were all going to have to take our clothes off, and we did. We had the button-up cop uniforms that we tore off every single night. We had the nice shiny boxers that we politely stepped out of every night and threw into the audience. They had to give those back. And uh, we also, at the climax of the show, which now I realize is a very aptly placed term, um, we, we had on shiny red G-strings that, you guessed it, tore away, and we would rip those off. 
But before we could even get to that point, we kind of sit around in a circle, and I realized, you know, I'm surrounded by a group of guys that I largely knew already. We had done mostly what, what we call straight plays, which is there's no music, it's just kind of dramatic or comedic, and you, you do your lines and so on and so forth. But we had a couple people that were experienced in the musical theater world. There's Eric DeChico, who was our lead. He was also an educator, so he was a great kind of resource for any questions I had. And he was as confident doing your straight acting as he was doing musical theater acting. And that gave me a lot of confidence just kind of watching him. Then there was David, who had already become a friend of mine. David Gerard, he first and foremost, not the quarterback. He's already much more talented than the quarterback. Um, he was one of those guys that was always the coolest guy in the room. But what makes David so cool is he makes you feel like you're the coolest guy in the room. And those are the type of people that you just don't run from. I love David. Then there is Blake. And Blake is this fabulous gay man who loved to give us a hard time because he was experienced in musical theater, he was experienced in choreographed dance, and he was experienced in wearing minimal clothing on stage. He was a Rocky Horror Picture Show vet, so if you've seen that put on in town, you've probably seen Blake. And he liked to make light of all of us guys who were truly, by all appearances, blue-collar guys because none of us really were familiar with singing on stage. None of us were really familiar with dancing on stage, though we got familiar. And none of us certainly were familiar with getting buck naked on stage. But we did. And the sort of camaraderie that was built there was something that I've never forgotten and something that I never took for granted. Sadly, I don't keep in touch with all those people these days, but that's kind of the way that life is for me. See, I look at those friendships and those relationships that I've had in my life now, and I, I view them as kind of like the ocean and the shore. And all of us, all of you, you're all your own shoreline. And then all the people that come and go, they're like the ocean. They come in and they leave. Sometimes they leave some things on the shore, and sometimes they take some things away. Well, by this point in my life, because of that inner anxiety, I started kind of conflating the two and thinking, you know, am I just permanently everybody else's shoreline because I'm the one that's in and out and I, I wasn't really keeping track if I was taking anything or leaving anything behind and I didn't have social media to check up on my friends back then. And so that kind of starts to mess with my head. And we start doing this play and we're getting a really good reception we ended up extending it an extra weekend, so I can't remember if that made it four or five weekends, but it was somewhere in there. And at one point I heard a rumor that the Westboro Baptist Church was going to be there. And when I tell you I was excited, I was excited. But they chickened out and they didn't show up. So the last night of the show comes, and as is customary in community theater, the actors help the tech crew tear down the set. So I'm surrounded now by the smell of chip paint, dust being kicked up all around me, making me stuffy, and I'm allergy prone, so of course I'm sneezing all over the place. By the way, when this is over for anyone who has a Claritin, I'm, I would like one. Um, and then there's this sound of sweeping, and that's the one that I remember the most, is the sound of the sweeping off stage left. And I even know what side of the stage it was on, because at this point, I'm standing dead center in the stage at Players by the Sea, the main stage, and all the house lights are on, and I'm alone, except for that sound of the broom, which I hearken back to the tide, because it sounds to me like the tide, which to me is nothing more than the sound of the earth breathing. And the only other person around is our stage manager, Carl, and we're not saying anything, but he's sitting front row in these red upholstered seats, which I can also smell, because it's an old theater. And I stand at the center of this stage, and I just start to cry. And back then, if you were to ask me why I was crying, which Carl, to his credit, jumped up out of his seat, wrapped his arms around me, and he just held me for two or three minutes without saying or asking me a damn thing. And it was finally when he did that I uttered simply, I don't know, Carl. But I look back now at that moment, at that entire experience, as the culmination of 21 years of my life, of 21 years of thinking that I was the ocean sweeping up onto other people's shoreline and realized that in that moment, that that was the first time that I felt still inside. That I realized that, no, I'm not the shore or the water washing onto other people's shore. I am a shoreline. 
And if for nobody else other than myself, I am a constant. And so I just cried. And the thing is this, is I look back on that now and I think about how uncomfortable I was in the beginning and all those anxieties about doing musical theater and taking my clothes off and bearing it all in front of all these people. And the message that I really want to relay with that is this. There's going to be that thing that you're afraid to do, but you want to do it. Because you know it's going to be fun. You know it's going to help you grow. You know it's going to be exciting. It's going to give you a story to tell. And so if I leave you with nothing else other than a few funny anecdotes about ripping a red G-string off of my skinny body, it's that next time an opportunity presents itself, step out onto that stage, take a page from my book, and go the full Monty. Thank you very much. Storytellers, here's your cast for tonight. We've been listening to Untold Stories. Hi, I'm David McGowan. I'm the CEO at WJCT Public Media, and I'm joined here by Numa Saislin, the CEO of the Florida Theater, and Barbara Colacello, the Artistic Director of Untold Stories. And we're here just to talk for a few minutes about the series itself and how it came to be. So, Numa, share with us how this series came to exist. Three or four years ago, Kevin Stone, our Vice President of Programming, who you know, and I were at a meeting. And someone at this meeting began talking about the storytelling series uh, that they attended uh, in another city. And I leaned over to Kevin and said, we're totally stealing this idea. <laughs> uh, and it's not an original idea. I mean, there, there's the Moth Radio Hour and uh, the stories you hear on that program are from storytelling right. series and festivals all across the country. So it wasn't like we actually stole an idea. Uh, but you know, oh, I love that. We steal ideas all the time, and, <laughs> and and now we're stealing it right with you. So, so uh, you know, we immediately thought this would be a great thing to do in Jacksonville to localize for Jacksonville. Uh, we began working on it immediately. Uh, my first thought was, we are theater managers and promoters. We know how to put a show on the stage. Uh, we know how to promote and market a show and sell the tickets, uh, but we are not artistic people. Uh, and so right away, we thought we have to find an artistic director who can uh, shape each performance because you can't put six creative people on stage with a musician and expect them all to just make magic happen. It has to be shaped by someone. And I'm guessing your choice was kind of obvious. And Jackson. that was Barbara. Um, uh, I had originally I started asking around just right. people I knew to say who who could, in town could do this. And a number of people immediately suggested Barbara. And we had worked before right. Right. together already. So it was a super easy fit. And uh, I was super excited when I heard uh, what the Florida Theater wanted to do. And Barbara but, hosts a storytelling uh, right. slam. I and, have a space called Babs Lab. I know. And every time I go to the Cork District open house, I walk by that space and I think to myself, wow, this is this is where the magic happens, right? It, yeah, it, it's really taken off. I have to actually turn people away the last couple of times for the story slams. I can't fit 90 people. I could fit 80. <laughs> but um, yeah, when Newman told me about it, I, I felt really excited. And one of the things that I do do is I'm a narrative coach. So I help, I help People shape their stories. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that, about the work that you do with the storytellers, because as we've heard on this program, they're really eloquent. They feel it's almost hard to imagine someone being able to get up in front of an audience, a live audience, and share a personal story in a way that is compelling and smooth in a way. Right. How do you do that it, well, work with Well, it's them. a process. I, I try to pick people that have some kind of uh, experience in their job or in, you know, their hobbies that they are, are okay with talking to, you know, groups of people. But we take an idea, and these really are untold stories in the sense that someone says, well, I had, this is what I came up with for the theme. But then I start asking questions, and the way you listen – you listen for what they're avoiding, and then I go and ask those questions. So they start making connections. I've had so many storytellers telling me, I never 
saw this before. So you, part so of your a, job a, is actually yes. drawing the story out of yeah, it. Yeah, and it's a discovery process, and that's what I think makes it real exciting, that when the audience is there, they know, they can feel it, that this is like a first-time reveal. Mm-hmm. So that's where I think we get a lot of the excitement. And you know, one of the things I wanted to ask both of you about was something that you say in the introduction to this program that we've just been listening to, which is about how this is a sacred ritual, this storytelling, and that it's not only a ritual for the storyteller, it's actually a ritual for the listener. And the listener is really part of the experience. And I think one of the things that I love about these recordings that we've been listening to is how you can feel the live atmosphere. This is not someone kind of doing what we're doing right now, which is talking into a microphone in a radio studio. This is someone talking to a group of people that they are actually looking at. I think key to the experience is the witnessing. The storyteller could go to the dress rehearsal. We work with it. We've heard it, you know, 50 times. The minute they get in front of that audience, it intensifies because of other people. The sharing, uh, the tribe comes together, the acknowledgement. Everyone receives it differently. And a lot of people go to the storytellers and will say things to them. Some people will cry and some people will just sit there and learn something or say, I've been there. I know that. So you can't predict that. But theater is about witnessing. Numa, I'm guessing that there are a lot of people who come to this Untold Story series at the Florida Theater who may be new to the Florida Theater. They're different than the audience that comes to your musical performances or some of the many other things that you do there. One of the things I love about my job is that uh, we see so many different audiences night to night. Uh, you know, you there might be a comedian one night and a classic rock act the next night and a traditional country act the next night and a hip hop act the next night. And those are all very different audiences. Uh, untold stories uh, is part of the effort behind it is an effort to get a newer audience in for something different uh, and specifically a local audience. I think everybody knows the Florida theater as a great place to see a national act right. that's touring the country. Uh, and it's a big room and it's an expensive room to operate. Uh, so you know, there's a, uh, not a wide range of programming that works in the room. Uh, this is very explicitly an effort to provide a platform to a local uh, to a set of local performers and writers, and to get a localized audience in to hear what they have to say. Right, and one of the things New- Numa stressed with me is this is Jacksonville stories. I want some kind of connection and bring neighborhoods together, so that you may not know somebody's experience living in Riverside uh, or someone's at Atlantic Beach. And you find out these these different things about places that you live or recognition of, I was standing there. I've been to that spot that they're talking about. Uh, So it elevates what Jacksonville is about. And I think also really showcases the variety of human experience that we have right in our midst. Right. And I think that's something. I've been to one of the Untold Stories performances. Uh, I felt that atmosphere in the room. I think one of the things that I've gained from listening to even more of the stories as we're doing this work together here now as a as a radio program and a podcast is the sheer diversity of experience that we share. And it makes me wonder uh, your thought, Barbara. I mean, is this is there a story like this in all of us? I think that I mentioned I see your space in the in, in the Cork well, Arthur's and I think, you know, you always make you think what encourage... would your story be, right? That's the thing that I think we all wonder if, as we listen. I encourage people to get up. That's why the space is there. It's, to me, it's a low-risk uh, space. You've got nothing to lose. It's fun. And at the end of the evening, people vote for their favorite storytellers. Just this week, we heard some really intense stories. But, you know, people had to get them out. And, um Yes, we all carry stories. And some people are a little better at sharing, but everyone can get better at sharing. Just do it. Well, thank you very much, both Numa and Barbara, for joining us. 
Thank you. Untold Stories, live at the Florida Theater, on the radio at WJCT News 89.9, and on podcast platforms everywhere. Join us and spread the word, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. This audio series is a production of WJCT Public Media and the Florida Theater. Untold Stories at the Florida Theater is made possible in part by generous support from the Wolfberg family.